So, women's retreats. I'm just not sure that's a great idea. I'm sorry, but I've been at home with three children. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it amazing how you can live in a house for years and not know where anything is? <laughs> not know where the soap for the dishwasher is. Not know where the kids' clothes are. Not know where your own clothes are. <laughs> so Kim returned home last night at an ungodly hour, about nine o'clock at night, with a look of victory on her face. <laughs> a look that said, now you know what it's like. And there's a great temptation to exert a little Christian manipulation and start saying things like, isn't it wonderful how God has made men and women different? <laughs> how women are smaller and closer to the floor and therefore can pick things up much easier than men. <laughs> How their feet are slightly shorter so they can get closer to the dishwasher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can see I'm getting myself into trouble here. Anyway, as I said, we're in the middle of a series, 40 Days Faith, which I think for uh, a lot of us has been really an opportunity to refresh our faith, refresh our faith in God fresh what it means to have faith in God. And we began really uh, on this journey of 40 days with a very simple thought. Are we willing to listen to God, hear God, and then do what he says? Are we willing to listen to God and then do what he says? And this week, I want to just touch on another aspect of faith, which we haven't really looked at or thought about a lot. We touched on faith as my faith, but we haven't thought a great deal about Faith as our faith. Is faith something that belongs to me, or is it something that is between us, that is ours? And I want to talk a little bit about the church, always a popular subject. I'm going to talk a little bit about the church and about faith in the church. And by that, I don't mean putting your faith in the church, but faith existing and living in the church. I want to start by confessing my own struggles with the church. I've not had an easy time with the church. I would say that until the age of 32, the church kept me away from God. When I finally became a Christian, I realized that I was very angry with the church. I felt that the church had not represented God to me in any way that was either meaningful or something that I could relate to. But I want to suggest to us this morning that if we struggle with the church at whatever level, at some level, we're going to struggle with our faith. Because faith is not an individual thing, or it's not solely an individual thing. It's also something that's among us and between us. So I want to do something this morning. It's going to take about five minutes. I want to tell you the story of the church for the last 2,000 years. And I want you to look for a pattern as I tell this story of the church. So the story of the church, and I'm going to go quite quickly, so you need to be very concentrated. The story of the church begins with an itinerant preacher named Jesus from Nazareth who comes bringing the message of God, a message of the kingdom of God that refreshes, revives, and reforms their understand, the understanding of early Judaism. He gathers around him a bunch of disciples, about 12 of whom become close, whose understanding of God is refreshed, reformed, and revived. Jesus leaves them to get on with the job of the church, the ecclesia, the gathered people of God, by dying on a cross and ascending to heaven, telling them to wait for the Spirit. Bye. On the day of Pentecost, the puzzled and somewhat dispirited disciples are gathered in an upper room. The Spirit falls on them. They see something like tongues of fire, speak in tongues, amazed gathered crowds. The disciples' faith is refreshed, reformed, and revived. About 3,000 people come to faith in Jerusalem on that day. The message is taken out from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And little house churches start all over the place, cozy. But before too long, things are already going wrong in some of the churches. And the apostle and missionary Paul spends a great deal of his time doing what? Refreshing, reforming, and reviving the church. Skip through a couple of centuries, a bit of persecution on and off, a lot of theological arguing about the nature of God, the Trinity, who Jesus is, mix in some steady growth, some really bad persecution, and then at the beginning of the fourth century, things get a whole lot better for the church when the Roman emperor, Constantine, makes Christianity the 
uh, state religion. The trouble is, lots of people start flooding into the church who are not really interested in Christianity. It's just the fashionable thing to do. Best way to impress your boss, a bit superficial. So guess what? Some folk think it's time to refresh, revive, and reform the church. Some desert fathers spring up, head off into the desert to um, explore the things of the Spirit. My favorite of these early reforming ascetics is a guy called Simeon the Stylite, who spent 37 years sitting on top of a 30-foot, then a 60-foot pillar. People flocked to him, surprisingly. We plunge into the Middle Age as the church becomes more and more institutionalized, a long, slow period of the growth of the power and influence of the papacy, the pope, that the pope, the papacy becomes extremely corrupt. My favorite pope was a guy called Pope Formosus, who got involved in the local politics, made some enemies. After his death, his rivals took their revenge, exhumed his rotting corpse, put on his full papal regalia, put him on a throne, tried him, it's good, cut off two of his fingers, decided he was guilty, he didn't really answer back, and um, <laughs> things are getting pretty bad, and guess what? Another movement springs up which is going to reform, revive, and refresh the church, the monastic movement. The Desert Fathers have set the pattern. Now we get friars and monks, and you get extraordinary faith-filled folks. But guess what? The monasteries become more and more powerful, more and more influential. They become associated with the institutional church. After a while, um, uh, another reformer comes up, a guy called Martin Luther, a young guy in the 15th century. He does what? He reforms the church. Faith is refreshed, reformed, and revived. Leads to the Reformation. We call it the Reformation. Guess what? 100 years after Luther, the Lutheran church has become as crusty and old as a dead cockroach. So another reform movement comes up. The Pietist movement grows up, led in part by a name man called Count Zinzendorf, who leads to the Moravian church, which will in the end influence Wesley, who will influence Pentecostalism, who will influence the charismatic movement. And here we are now in the 21st century. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. So what's my point? Throughout history and until the return of Christ, the Spirit has always been at work and will be at work reforming, reviving, and renewing the church. Why? Because the church is the crucible of faith. The church is the crucible of faith. Faith does not just belong to you and me. Faith is not simply an individual journey. Do you see the pattern? God is constantly reviving and renewing and reforming faith, and he does it through his church. Now, you may have struggled with the church like me, but I tell you what, God loves his church. God absolutely adores his church, and he will go on working with his church until the return of Christ. That's the way it is. And there is something in the very nature of faith that is designed to bring you and me into community. That's what it does. Now, we're very used in the West to the idea of support. We have support groups of all kinds. We're used to the idea that I can get support for my journey. But if we don't see the great faith not only points us as individuals to God, but it also points us to each other, we're missing something. When I uh, first became a Christian, I was struggling with the church. Didn't know whether I really liked the church very much, honestly. Not sure that I really wanted to be in a church, but I found myself through circumstance or fortune or providence, whatever you want to say, in a small group of men. There were about eight to ten of us. Al Hardy was one of them. Al, Pastor Al, was one of them. And we would meet at 6.30 on Friday mornings. And then afterwards, we would go and have bacon and eggs, which is a very British thing to do. And that's why we, were, we called ourselves the Bacon Boys. That's what we did. We met, we talked, we discussed things of faith. I remember that I was pretty hot-headed in those days. I thought I knew it all. We had some cracking arguments. I remember one or two arguments with Al. Al was married, and we were talking about girls and what you do when you're walking down the street in the lovely spring morning. In London, and there's an attractive girl who walks towards you. What do you do? I remember furious arguments about that. But I was, <laughs> I was young and foolish. I didn't know any better. And I thought I was right. Now I'm old and wise. And now I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you what, the funny thing was that we talked about a lot of things, not just about girls, although that did come up quite a lot. But in the end, 
It wasn't that I got my answers in the small group. It wasn't that I was simply supported and encouraged in my journey. In the end, the group became the point. That's what faith was doing in me. It was pushing me together with people for no other reason than being with those people. There's something in the very nature of faith that is designed to bring you into community, into connection, unity with other believers. I probably crossed a boundary in doing some church history this morning. Um, my, I go to seminary, and they, uh, my professors keep telling me, whatever you do, don't teach theology on Sunday mornings. So I've done church history. Let's do some theology. What is the purpose of faith? The purpose of faith, surely, ultimately, is to bring us into connection with God. What's God like? Well, God is Father, Son, and Spirit. God himself is a fellowship. God himself is a community. Is it any surprise that faith, therefore, should push us into community? That's what faith does. Because in a way, what we're doing here this morning represents what God is like. God is both distinct, he is Father, Son, and Spirit, or he's three distinct persons, but he is also fellowship. Faith is intended to push us into fellowship. And how do I know how important this is? Because I tell you what, as I talk to, I always do this when I'm before I talk, I talk to a few people and hear what they have to say when I ask them about this. And I, I spoke to one guy, and he talked to me and said, yes, the trouble is, what happens when it goes wrong? What happens when that fellowship goes wrong? And I've talked to people and listened to people who've had bad experiences of the church, who've been maybe very connected to a church and then found themselves breaking away from that church for whatever reason. And they've said to me that it is more painful or as painful as a divorce. That's interesting to me. Why would it be so painful if there was not something inherently right about it? In exactly the same way as divorce is so painful because there is something inherently right about marriage. We were intended, faith is an intended way of us being pushed together. God wants faith in the church, and that's what the Spirit is constantly doing. Listen to Jesus' words. It was when he was talking about the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God would come. The kingdom of God, I would assume, is a place where faith is very alive. We're listening to God and doing what he says is right at the heart of it. This is what Jesus said. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's among you. And the Greek uses a little word, en, there, that in some versions of the Bible is translated as within you. You might have heard that. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And you say, well, that's me. The kingdom of God is in me. That's right. But that word can also be translated as among, that the kingdom of God exists among us. That's where it's found. If that's where the kingdom of God is, then that's where faith is as well. So when we ask ourselves, where is my faith when things get a little hard, what's your immediate reaction? Do you run to your closet? That's a good thing to do. And pray to God. But do you also run to the church? When things get hard, is that your instinct to run to other believers? When you heard this scripture this morning, and you listen to it. Did you hear it for yourself? Or did you hear it for the church? This is from Revelation 3, 7, 13. Listen to it again. And as you listen to it, can you hear it, not just for yourself, but for the church? These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Can you hear that for this church? Can you hear that for the body of believers that you're connected to? I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that while no one will take your crown. Whose crown? My crown? Or our crown? 
or both. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Who, me? I'm the one who's going to be victorious? Or us, the church, or both? Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. God is going to come down to us. We're not going up to him. He's coming down to us. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 